All right, Dale, you want to come for our morning uh, announcements? While he's on his way up, I'd like to give one, uh, Amber Jensen, which we had an exciting day here Friday. Friday was our Good Friday service, which we enjoyed very much. Also, um, Adam and Amber got married that day, and so we're, we're thrilled about that. And uh, Amber wanted me to say thank you for all those that uh, did things with the wedding. It was started out just to be a few people kind of gathered here for exchanging of vows. And they... Um, as they join themselves together before the Lord, uh, but we kind of let people know about it a little bit, and so like the ladies' Bible study came, and then Chris came and put flowers up, and they ended up making a meal and and everything. So it just kind of grew a little bit, and and uh, they were they were thrilled, and 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 of course we were thrilled to be able to be a part of it. But um, uh, she wanted me to thank you for that, and then also uh, as you know that in the last couple of weeks she's lost her father, which is a uh, very tough, especially right before a wedding like that. And and um, uh, the memorial service is coming up. I know many people volunteered to help provide food and stuff for that. Um, so uh, so you know that uh, Al Jensen's service is at Green Larson at 2 p.m. this coming Saturday. And uh, the luncheon afterward is at Rainier Hall at 4 p.m. Uh, just so you're aware of that. All right, Dill, come. Good morning, everyone. He is risen. Very good. Thank you. Uh, we did get a missionary letter from the Surrettes, just to tell you briefly what it said. Uh, their youth ministry, young people's ministry, is going very well on Saturday. In fact, he talked about some lady who brought her three kids to the youth meeting on a motorcycle. Don't tell Carter that. <laughs> so... Uh, desperately working or working to get there for that and that's great and uh, Brian and his daughter are still teaching part-time English and uh, that's working out very well it gives them opportunities to witness as well as well and one of the other things he mentioned quickly is that they you know they want to get a relationship with the people there and that's what ministry is all about so they had a camp out at their house so they had 40 people camping out at their house you want to try that one Greg <laughs> He's game, all right. <laughs> okay. Apparently it worked out very well. Okay, for announcements. Tuesday, Ladies Bible Study at the Kathy Lee Home. That's 1230 this Tuesday, so uh, be there for that. Wednesday activities are the normal activities. Uh, release time at 12 o'clock. 6 o'clock is Club Jam for the young people, and I don't know if anybody will bring a motorcycle with their kids, but come anyway, all right? And youth group at 7.30, so be there for that as well. Thank you. That's right. Next time uh, somebody asks me, how do I get my kids to Sunday school? I'm going to remind them of that lady with her three kids on the motorcycle. I heard, uh, I heard one lady ask another lady one time, how did you get your kids to church? She said, I put them in the car and I took them there. <laughs> That's how you do it. <laughs> That's how it works. <laughs> They catch that from you in a very direct ways, yes. Well, we're going to spend some uh, time in prayer together here this morning. Uh, continue to pray for Denny, the, the outcome of his uh, um, being looked at and, and his tests and stuff that he went through down in Duluth shows that he's got a few different things 100% uh, blocked within his heart. Most people's heart is pumping about 60% blood through there and his is pumping about 30%. Uh, the, the things that he has blocked and stuff, the heart does kind of make different paths and stuff to follow, I guess, when it has that kind of situation. But there's really, there's no surgery that can do it uh, because of the extent of the blockage. There's no stints that they can put in. And so uh, really at this point, he's, he's still in the hospital today. Fig drove back down to be with him this morning. Trishy's heading down tomorrow. And um, then they'll be moving him to therapy, which will take place up in Good Sam's up in the falls. Um, so the only thing really left is, is medication. And so uh, there's no timeline or anything. They just said, you know, it could happen soon, could go take, last for a while. You know, you just, you just don't know. So, so be, uh, be, be praying for, for Denny and for the Lodgerans. Continue to as they, as they go through this. Let's go ahead and pray. Our Father, we're thankful for this day and thankful for the opportunity to be gathered together again here, Lord. And, and Father, we do have some things that we'd, we'd bring up before you. We do, we do think of Denny, and we continue to pray for him, just that you would uh, be at work with him, within him, within his body, within his uh, spirit, his soul, as you draw him closer to yourself. And Just thank you for the family support that he has around him, and 
And uh, God, we just uh, pray again that that in all this that you would be glorified and that he would uh, receive good at your hands. And, and we know that we know that he will. Father, we also think, Lord, I think of Bernie who had knee surgery a couple weeks ago here, or a little over a week ago, and and uh, and Kenny with back surgery. We just pray for them that you'd uh, continue to help them to heal and to recover. Thank you that they're they should be past the point of the the most excruciating pain and stuff. And so we just pray for comfort for them and and also uh, uh, just encouragement. As you know, obviously it's going to take some time of being keeping per, fairly immobile. So. Uh, and that can be tough to do on its own. So we just pray for him in that way as well. Father, we continue to pray for Amber's family. Uh, thank you for the blessings in her family this week as, uh, as her and Adam uh, came together and married. And and uh, I just thank you for the, the wonderful things that you've been doing in their life over the last year or two. And and uh, but Father, we uh, also think of, of the sad things uh, that the family's dealing with as they prepare for the funeral this uh, coming Saturday of her father and so God, we just pray that you would work in that situation as well and uh, thank you for thank you for the opportunity for our church to just really uh, be there for Amber and and support her and her family through through all these things the happy things and the sad things as families do uh, father we do continue to pray for Taylor and thank you that she is able to get up and and walk out under her own steam and we pray that uh, whatever it was it was uh, uh, bothering her this morning and that would cause her to pass out Lord that uh, it would be something easily remedied and pray that you'd be with uh, Jason and Kelly and the family and, and, and everything as well uh, as, they, as they go through this time here Father thank you for this, uh, this opportunity to worship for this opportunity to reflect on what you've accomplished in our hearts um, the amazing feat of the resurrection when stopped and considered alongside the awesomeness of our God is not such a big undertaking, but something that you uh, have accomplished for us and we're thankful for it. It's in Jesus' name that we pray it. Amen. All right, at this time, the Holty girls are going to... Are you... Uh, oh, that's right. We should pray for that. Thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah, let's... Uh, pray father we also think of the, of the sathers today too lord i think of of patrick and what a nice guy he he was or is and and father um as he passed away this week we just pray that you'd be with with kevin and leanne and the family uh, as they go through this time of experiencing this loss of 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 patrick as well pray there'd be a time of of mixed emotions that there'd be many joys as they think of memories that they'll share with one another uh, mixed in with that sorrow of of missing him greatly so we just pray for your blessing on their family as well. It's in Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. All right, thank you.
Okay, let's take our Bibles out. We're going to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15, we'll be reading, begin reading in verse 1. It says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast the word that I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried and that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then He appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, He appeared also to me." For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On, on the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead... How can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. And if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished, if in Christ we have no hope in this life, or in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. You know, we're actually going to cover the whole chapter, which is pretty lengthy, but I think we'll end our reading of it for the time being right there. You know, the resurrection, we're here to, today to celebrate something that is the, that is, the, it is Christianity. Right, with, if you take away the resurrection, there, there is no Christianity. If you take away the res resurrection, there is no, when you think of our other holidays, there is no Christmas. Because if, the, if it wasn't for the resurrection, if Jesus Christ didn't rise again from the dead, then why would we really need to mark his birth? And that kind of thing. So the, the resurrection is the central point of Christianity. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul is saying here. Is he's saying, look, it all hinges on that one thing. You know, some of the skeptics and people that would stand up against Christianity have rightly recognized that this is the central feature of Christianity. If you get rid of the resurrection, it all goes away. In fact, that's what, uh, like Lee Strobel, for example, that's what he set out to disprove. Josh McDowell, he set out to disprove the same thing because they both saw the same truth. They didn't believe in, in Christianity. They didn't follow it. But they wanted to get rid of it for one reason or another. Josh McDowell said he was tired of hearing about Christians, wanted to shut them all up. And so he thought, if I can prove that the resurrection didn't happen, well, then I'll get rid of it. They'll have to shut up. And so he set out to prove it wrong, and he ended up writing a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict, which actually proved that the resurrection was a very real and historical event. Lee Strobel, it was a little more personal, I think. Lee Strobel, he said his, his, his wife came to Christ and he thought, what is this cult that my wife is getting involved in? And her life started to change, and he didn't necessarily want all the changes that were coming with that. And so he started to look into it to, for the purpose of proving his wife, proving to his wife that she really didn't need that, that they could move on, get life back to normal. And so he was an uh, investigative reporter, and so he began to travel around and interview experts and stuff to try to show her that the resurrection really is just a myth 
and um, found out that it actually was a historical event, and today he's a minister, he's a pastor. Well, the Apostle Paul said the same thing. There's a word that keeps popping up over and over throughout this whole passage, and you know what it is? It's the word vain. Vain, or maybe a very similar word, futile. He uses both of those. And, and he says at the very beginning, he, he's writing to the, to the Corinthians, and he says, you know what, I, I'm going to write to you about the gospel. Now, now not, not the gospels, right? right? There's four books at the beginning of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We call those the gospel of Matthew, the gospel of Mark, the gospel of Luke, the gospel of John. Not those. Those are the good news. The word gospel means good news. Those are the good news of Jesus Christ. They contain the gospel, but they're not in and of themselves the gospel. The gospel is, as he defines it here, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That Jesus died on the cross for our sins, that he was buried, that he rose again on the third day to give us victory over sin and death. That is the gospel. And the Apostle Paul says here that it is of utmost of first importance. This is of first importance. And the first place that he uses the word vain was he says, I want to remind you of this because this is the thing that saves you unless you have believed in vain. In other words, their, their belief was shallow. Their belief was empty. They were believing without a cause. They weren't, they, they, they weren't genuinely putting their faith in Christ. He says if, you're, if, you're, if your belief was, a, was empty, it wasn't real, then, then you're not being saved by it. But if your belief is real, then this is the thing that saves you, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But then he goes on from there and farther into the passage in, uh, in verse 14, it says, If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. Verse 17, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. And so the, the Apostle Paul, in fact, he's going to uh, boil it down a little bit farther. You're going to see as we get farther into it, he's going to say, Look, if Christ is not risen from the dead, then let's forget all this stuff. Let's eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow we die. He was a, a man that was being persecuted for going around and preaching about the resurrection. And he's saying, look, if, if, it is, if the gospel only gives me hope in this life, if there is no resurrection, and so there is no future life to look forward to, if I'm looking only at what the gospel can give me during this life, he says, I'm of all people most to be pitied. He says, this doesn't make any sense at all for me to go on and live out this faith in the gospel if the resurrection is not true he says my life is vain in fact he says my preaching is vain your faith is vain in what i preach because actually i'm not only is it not right that there's no resurrection but he says actually i would be a liar because i've been misrepresenting god if there is no resurrection and so the apostle paul's conclusion is this if there if christ is risen then there is a resurrection and it is all of first importance, all most meaningful. If Christ is not risen from the dead, then there is no resurrection of the dead, then this stuff is vain. It's empty. It's futile. And so, you know what, it really, is, as we're looking at it here this morning, it's, well, what is it? Which is it? Is it... Is the things that we're doing here gathered together this morning and, and worshiping God and living our life for Christ and, and, and trusting in Him and following Him, is it, is it of utmost importance, first of importance, or is it futile? Is it vanity to be pursuing this? And that's what chapter 15 is all about. And it's the most extensive teaching throughout the Bible on the, on the resurrection and, uh, and the most all-encompassing, and I want the big picture, so we're going to stay on the big picture level. So there's a lot in here that we're not going to get down to the nitty-gritty on everything. Otherwise, we'll be here for all the rest of the week. But, but we're going to hit kind of each section briefly and look at what he teaches us specifically about the resurrection. It is the resurrection. It is the key to all of it. It's the key to our eternal life with God. It's the, it's the key to being delivered of our sins. It's the key to... To following Christ, to, to experiencing Christ, um, it, is, it is the center of all things. And as we look at this idea of the resurrection here this morning, the first thing that we see is in the first 11 verses, he starts out and what he does is he just proves Christ's resurrection. 
He focuses on the resurrection of Christ and he says, look, this is, this is beyond doubt. This is beyond doubt. It's, it's kind of like what uh, Timothy Keller said. Um, my wife, Lisa, just read me a quote from Timothy Keller. She came across it in something she was reading the other day. And she said, listen to this from Timothy Keller. And it's, it's not anything that a thousand other people haven't said. But he, he just has a way with words sometimes. And, and, and she, he just said, look, it's all about this. If Christ rose from the dead, then everything that he said is true. If Christ didn't rise from the dead, then who cares what he said about anything? You see, you, don't, you can't really approach this from, well, do I agree with Christ's teachings or not? Do I think that the things that he said were good, and so then that makes him a good teacher, so then maybe I should follow him? You got, the, you got it all backwards if you look at it that way. Actually, what it is, is, is he, is he the Son of God or not? You see, he was demonstrated to be the Son of God through his resurrection from the dead. If Christ rose from the dead, that's not something you or I can do. That's a God thing. If Christ rose from the dead, then he is the Son of God, which means everything that he says is absolutely true. Why do I follow Christ here this morning? It's because I am absolutely convinced that he rose again from the dead. And that's what the Apostle Paul is saying. He's saying, look at the, look at the evidence that's out there. And you know, I got a little bit curious. I got a little bit curious because in today's world, we're always hearing about following the science, right? And, um, uh, and I like to remind people that, you know, the weather forecast is also science, so do with that what you will. But, but you're, always, you're always hearing about this, all oh, follow the science, and everything has to be proved scientifically and all that kind of stuff. Now, don't get me wrong. Science has a huge value. It also stands on the foundation of Christianity, and, and uh, if you look back in history, because they said because we have a reasonable God to make things to function in a reasonable manner, we can trust that they will continue to operate in a reasonable manner. Therefore, you can find physical laws and things like that. That's the basis of science, but I don't want to get too far down that road. But here's the deal. Our generation has kind of got to this point where, boy, if science doesn't prove something, then you really don't know if it's true. Right? Even though there's plenty of evidence that if science does know something, you might know it's true. But, you know, I got curious. Because scientific proof is not the only kind of proof. You know what is a very solid kind of proof? Is eyewitness testimony. And I got thinking, because I've been involved in a couple of jury trials and stuff like that, and I was amazed when I was on a jury that took a couple weeks long to find this case. It was a murder case from outside the area that got moved here because a judge somewhere else died. And uh, I sat on that case, and I listened, and I, I was just waiting because of watching TV. I was just waiting for all the forensic evidence, right? The DNA that they found from a little drop of sweat somewhere or the fingerprint that was on the hatch where they came up through the floor into this... Uh, into this quick, uh, what do you call it, mini mart and that kind of thing. And, and uh, I kept waiting. In fact, we even asked. I asked at some point, well, are there fingerprints? Is there DNA? And it amazed me that we got all the way to the end of the trial and there was really a serious lack of forensic evidence. But you know what? We still found that guy guilty of murder. Based on what? Based on the testimony of witnesses that were around the scene that night. And people that run into them in different places during that night. I got curious yesterday, and I, I googled it. It's like how many how many crimes are solved by DNA evidence? Because I thought surely there would be some in the trials that I was at. And the first things that I found was what jurors expect. They said, you know what? If you have these different kinds of trials and they've interviewed jurors, the jurors expect to see DNA evidence. They expect to see forensic evidence to be able to make the decision with. And they usually, depending on the kind of a trial, they will be anywhere from 22%. They expect to see it 22% of the time to 46% to of the time. But you know what? It's so far removed from what actually happens. The best numbers that I could find is one uh, agency said uh, that kind of forensic evidence is actually only uh, helpful in less than 1% of all cases that are tried and and not only that one place that went a little further with it said it's actually about one case in every 1300 cases where that DNA kind of evidence ends up proving to be helpful 
in, in establishing the guilt or innocence of an individual. And I was just thought, man, all the things that we, we think that everything around us is just so scientifically proven, but you know what the fact of the matter is, it's not. And you know what, for historical events, it's not, you're not going by DNA and forensic evidence, what are you going by testimony of witnesses, people that were there. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul does here, is he just establishes first off the proof in Christ's resurrection. Did he rise again from the dead or did he not? And it says, look, he, was, he, he, he rose again from the dead, and then how do we know that? Because of all the eyewitnesses. He says that he appeared, he rose on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are, fa- are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. He appeared to James, he appeared uh, to all the apostles. Last of all, he said he appeared to me, and so he just goes through all these people that he's seen. Now, when you look at it, I don't want to spend, I can't spend a lot of time in there. We don't have that much time. We could spend the whole time just right in this. The apostles, where were the apostles when Christ got taken to the cross? They went into hiding. They were behind locked doors in an upper room, afraid that something was going to happen to them. But shortly after that, what do we see? All of a sudden, they come out of that locked room and they come boldly proclaiming the gospel right in the temple and right out in public. Now, what changed? What changed? They were hiding, afraid to get caught. They were out in the public, getting arrested, saying, sorry, but we got to obey God rather than you. And then they let them go, and they proclaim the, the resurrection again. They arrest them again. They beat them, and they send, tell them the same thing. Sorry, but we got to obey God rather than you. All of a sudden, they're just bold. They were hiding, going back to fishing. I'm going back to fishing. I'm not going to do this anymore. And then all of a sudden, they're boldly proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What would make a difference like that? They say, it's because we saw him. He rose again from the dead. Now that would answer it. I can't think of another thing that would answer it, but that would answer it. Because you follow their life on from there, what happens? They continue to testify for for the resurrection. Well, what are they getting from it? Because when you think about it, if, if, uh, if you're looking at the resurrection and, and if you say, well, the resurrection is not true, it's a, it's a myth, it's a hoax, then we're talking about the people that made up the myth. We're talking about the people that made up the hoax, right? If this is all a big joke, they're the, they're the writers of this joke. But what did their life look like following that? Every one of them stayed loyal to the truth of the resurrection all the way to their death. Every one of them was persecuted and tortured all the way to their death. John didn't actually die from his persecution. He's the only one that lived into an older age. But uh, even he was tortured. But they all, all the way to their death. See, the point is, this myth is the worst myth they could have ever made up because all they did was pay a huge price for it that eventually culminated in their death. And why would they die for something that they know is a lie? As I said, I know, I think I just said a couple weeks ago, I said, you know, people, don't, people make things up to get out of trouble, not to get into trouble. But if these guys made it up, then they made it up to get into trouble. There's just absolutely no, there is no explanation for the change that you see in their life that makes any sense except for the fact that Jesus rose again from the dead. But even with that, the Apostle Paul says, you know, you don't have to take their word for it even. He says there were over 500 brothers who saw him at one time And he says, some have fallen asleep, which he talked about, death. Some of them have died. So a few of them have died, but 500 people that saw Christ in one outing. In other words, what's he saying? He's saying, look, you don't even have to take our word for it. You can add, there's over 500 people that you can ask that'll tell you the same thing. They'll tell you they saw Christ risen from the dead. You know, the Apostle Paul uses his, his own example. He says, then the last of all, there was me. He's like, I was like one born out of due time. Right, because what's he referring to? He wasn't one of the 12 that followed Christ in his earthly ministry. Actually, when Christ was crucified and then, and then rose again and ascended into heaven, then the disciples started to spread the gospel. The Apostle Paul was a Pharisee at that time, which means he would have been one of the ones working the deals to try to get Pilate to crucify Christ. Which means as you follow his life in the book of Acts, you get up to about Acts chapter 7, and you find this guy, at that time his name is Saul, and he's trying to stamp out Christianity. He's trying to get rid of the church. 
And so that he's going around arresting people, having them beaten, having them imprisoned, some of them taking their lives. And you find him come across Stephen. Stephen is a deacon in the early church, and Stephen stands up and preaches the gospel, and the people pick up stones, and they stone Stephen to death. They put him to death. And it says in a little passage there, it says, and they laid their coats at the feet of Saul. In other words, the point they're making is Saul was the one who was giving the authority, saying, put him to death. And Saul acknowledges that later on in his ministry. Well, when you get up to Acts chapter 9, Saul has said, you know what, I don't want to just punish the Christians around Jerusalem. I want to go as far as Damascus and other cities. And so he goes to the council and says, give me letters of permission to go to these other cities, letters of authority showing that I have your support to go and imprison people, to do anything I can to stamp out Christianity. And so he is zealously trying to get rid of Christianity. And he's on his way to Damascus with a group, and, uh, and Jesus confronts him, and a bright light shines, and Jesus says, Paul, Paul, or Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you, Lord? And Jesus says, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And the, the Saul, the persecutor, becomes the Apostle Paul, and he ends up being the greatest preacher of the gospel. Now, here's another thing. What made that change? Why would somebody that was so adamantly trying to, even to the point of killing people, trying to get rid of Christianity, why would somebody so adamantly against Christianity all of a sudden be its greatest preacher of all times? Well, we get to hear his own testimony. Because later in the book of Acts, he ends up standing before governors and kings and he's questioned at different times. First, he's questioned by the Jewish council, the Jewish ruling council. And in Acts chapter 23, verse 6, it says, Now when Paul perceived that one part of the were Sadducees and the other part were Pharisees. Pharisees was what he used to be. The Sadducees are the ones that uh, control like the, the high priest and the temple worship. And the Sadducees didn't believe in a resurrection and the Pharisees did. And so when Saul noticed that it's kind of split and you got two different groups here, he uses that to his advantage actually at this point. But he does say this. He says, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope of the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. And so he makes that statement and then all of a sudden the Pharisees are like, oh, nothing wrong with him. <laughs> because, because he's towing their line. The resurrection is the truth. The Sadducees all of a sudden had big problems with him, and so they're kind of fighting between each other. So he kind of used that dysfunction there on the, on the board there to his advantage. Well, later when he's answering to Festus, because uh, the council ends up not being able to do anything with him, they try to move him on to Festus, trying to get him put to death. And uh, Paul's telling Festus, he's saying, look, I wasn't doing anything. I wasn't stirring up the crowd when they found me at the temple. I wasn't uh, arguing with anybody. I wasn't, I wasn't in any synagogue making waves. And he, he says this to him, he says, But this I confess to you, that according to the way, which they call a sect, the way is what Christianity was called at the beginning. He says, which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down in the law and written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So when Paul stands before Festus and first before the Sanhedrin and you say, and he gets a chance to clarify and say, look, this is why I'm arrested. I'm arrested. I'm on trial before you today because of the resurrection. I believe like the Bible teaches all the way up through now that there is a resurrection of the dead and that Christ was raised. Well, when you get to Acts chapter 24 and verse 21, so still talking to Festus, or was it Felix? Felix. It says, other than this one thing that I cried out while standing among them, it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you this day. So in other words, he fesses up to him. That, uh, and the, at the council, I said, look, it's because of the resurrection that I'm here today. Now, when we get to Acts chapter 26, he's going to stand before uh, King Agrippa and Bernice. And he's going to, and they want to hear his arguments, hear what he's arrested for, because the Jews are trying to get him put to death. And, and both Festus and Felix are like, ah, I, I just don't see it. I don't see any guilt in him. Uh, so Agrippa hears about it, and he wants to hear the case. And so the Apostle Paul tells him, he says, I consider myself fortunate 
that it is before you, King Agrippa, I am going to make my defense today because all the accusations of the Jews, especially because you are familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. And so he starts out by acknowledging that within Agrippa, he says, Agrippa, you are familiar with what? You're familiar with the customs and the controversies of the Jews. In other words, you know what the Jewish culture is like and how they operate and what their beliefs are and the controversies, the arguments that they have among themselves and the disputes that they're involved in currently. You're aware of those things. And so he says, I'm glad that I'm making my case to you because you have a, a basis to work from. And now I stand here on trial because of my hope and the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship night and day. And for this hope, I am accused by the Jews, O king. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? You see, he's saying, look, it's the, the very thing that the whole nation of Israel is hoping for. We're looking forward to that resurrection of the dead. We're looking forward to that coming of the Messiah. We're looking the the resurrection, that hope of the resurrection. He says, that's what all of Israel is still waiting for, looking forward to today, uh, as they have been for all, all time. And he says, why is it so amazing to you that God would raise the dead? I mean, this is, even, even as I prayed earlier, as we came into this service, that when you look at the resurrection of the dead, it's, a, it's an amazing event. But when you compare it to the abilities and the desires of God, then well, not so much. God can easily raise the dead. He who spoke the world and the universe into being can easily speak life into a mortal body. He's the one that took and formed us of the dust to begin with and breathed in us when we became a living soul. It's definitely not beyond God's abilities and not beyond God's desires as he desires to work within us, mercy and grace either. So the Apostle Paul is saying, why, why is this shocking to you that I would be here testifying that God raises the dead? But then he goes on, he says, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. So he's remembering before he became a Christian. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. That's like what happened with Stephen. And I punished them often in all the synagogues, and I tried to make them blaspheme, and in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. That's like his trip to Damascus. And so he's just reviewing. He's saying, look, I was trying to get rid of these people. But then he gives his experience on the road to Damascus and he tells them about the bright light shining and being confronted by Christ and he saw the risen Christ and then following that recount of that he says this he said in this connection I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and, com and commission of the chief priests at midday O king I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who journeyed with me and when we had fallen had all fallen to the ground, I heard the voice say to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness to the things which you have seen me, which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So the Apostle Paul says, look, I was in the middle of trying to get rid of these Christians. I was on my way to go do it in foreign cities and I was confronted by Christ. And Christ told me that now I'm going to go out and preach this gospel to people and bring them from darkness to light. And he tells Agrippa, he says, Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to a heavenly vision, but declared first to those who in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, then throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds and keeping with their repentance. For this reason the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day I have had the help that comes from God, and so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses 
said would come to pass that the Christ must suffer and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to, the, to our people and to the Gentiles. And so he say, he's just saying, look, Agrippa, I'm not teaching anything different than Moses did. The whole Old Testament points to the death and the resurrection of Christ on our behalf. And, and that's what I'm declaring. Now, this amazing life that Agrippa just heard about, this one that was so adamantly trying to get rid of Christianity, became so adamantly Christianity's greatest preacher. What made this change? Agrippa came to a conclusion, a flimsy one. He said, Paul, you're going crazy. He tells him in the very next passage, he says, And as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus, with a, with a loud voice, he says, Paul, Festus is the one that brought him to Agrippa. Um, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. Now, Paul's going to appeal not so much to Festus, but back to Agrippa. Because remember, Agrippa is the one that's familiar with everything, right? And so he, Festus kind of interjects, interrupts, and he says, Paul, you're out of your mind. All your learning has driven you crazy. But Paul said, I am not... I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus. But I am speaking true and rational words for the king, Agrippa, for the king knows about these things. And to him I speak boldly, for I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe. And so you see, the point is that the Apostle Paul, we have this guy that was so adamantly trying to get rid of the church, all of a sudden is its greatest preacher. What made the change? He, in a courtroom setting, declares, gives his own defense and tells what made the change. And what made the change? He said, I saw the risen Christ. And that's the story he stuck to all the way through his grave, to his grave, even though that story is what would put him in his grave. Now, why would the 11 that are left, other than Judas, of the apostles follow this all the way to their grave if they would have had to have been the ones that made it up, if it wasn't real? What would they have gained? They would have gained nothing in this life because they all suffered and died in ways that they would never have if they weren't preaching the gospel. The apostle Paul was like a, in a leadership position. He had climbed the ladder of the Pharisees. He had prestige and power and influence and 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 wealth and he said I count all that as rubbish for the sake of knowing Christ why knowing Christ as what led to his early death and if there's no resurrection from the dead then there's really no reward for him after this life either so you can't make an argument well he'll get some reward not if there's no resurrection from the dead he won't you see, the, the only thing that makes any sense out of this whole historical situation is that Christ really did rise again from the dead. And, and that's exactly what the Apostle Paul is, is saying here. He's saying, look, there's ample proof of Christ's resurrection. He was seen by all these people, the, the disciples, Paul himself, it changed his life. Um, over 500 people that were still alive, all this evidence, he says, uh, there's, it's just futile to argue against the resurrection of Christ. But then not only does he prove Christ's resurrection, in connection he proves our resurrection. Because he goes on to say in verse 12, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? And that's what when you look at this passage, this whole passage is, a, is like an if-then argument, right? You say, if this, then logically this is the conclusion. If this is true then this also has to be true. And that's what he's doing through the whole thing. If you look at the screen, the, the words in red are the if statements and the words in blue are the then statements. And, and he, he says, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, and this one doesn't actually start with the word then, but notice the structure of the sentence. It's actually, it's actually implied. Some of, the sentences will, uh, some of the sentences will actually have the word then, and the other ones it's implied. He says, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead. How can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? 
If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. If Christ has been raised, then our preaching, or if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain and we're even found to be misrepresenting God. So the whole passage, I don't have time to go through the whole thing, but it's all this big if-then statement. And what's the point that he's making? The point that he's making is that the, we see the reality of Christ's resurrection through the eyewitness testimony. If Christ is risen from the dead, we rise from the dead. In fact, he goes on to explain that Christ, Christ is the first fruits of those risen from the dead. Now, first fruits were a, they were an offering given by the Jews. Whereas when they harvested their crop, they'd take the very first part of the harvest of the crop and they would bring it and they would offer that up as an offering to God. And it, and it did two things. One of the things it did was it said thank you. It thanked God for the crop that they were harvesting. The second thing that it did was recognize that this is just the first. This is just the first fruits. In other words, there's a whole bunch more to come. And that's what he's saying here is he's saying, look, Christ in his resurrection from the dead, he's just the first fruits. In other words, he's the first one risen from the dead. If you use the word first, then that insinuates that there is a second. At least we're the second, all of us. He says Christ is the first one risen from the dead. And then who's the second? Those who are dead in Christ at his coming. And then who's the third? Well, this wouldn't actually be a resurrection, but it would be a rapture. He says they're not all going to be resurrected, but they're all going to be changed. And so, and so he says, look, Christ is just the first fruits of it. He's just the, he's just the beginning. And you know what? That is so encouraging to us. It's, a, it's like the passage that uh, I think of in, in 1 Thessalonians that it deals with the same thing. And he says, look, I don't want you to sorrow like those who have no hope. Why? Because his whole point is that we have hope. Because what's coming, you look earlier and look through that passage there, and he says, you know what's coming? When Christ comes, the very first thing he's going to do is all the dead in Christ are going to be resurrected. He's going to be bringing them with him, bringing their souls, their spirits with him. And as soon as he gets here, their bodies are going to come up out of the grave, and they're going to be resurrected, and they're going to be with Christ. And then instantly after that, we're going to have the rapture. Those who are left and remain will be caught up to be with him in the air and so you see he tells them he says they were all concerned about their loved ones so and so died grandma died or grandpa died before christ came back did they miss out he says no they didn't miss out they beat you there they beat you there so don't sorrow like those who have no hope you see this has intense practical implication for us one because if the resurrection of christ is true then it means there is life after death there is an eternal life. And through faith in Him, we get to participate in that eternal life. It means that in this life, we don't sorrow as those who have no hope. Because even if the, even if the gates of hell or if death itself kind of shakes you in your life, you cannot be defeated if you're trusting in Christ. Well, then he goes on from there to deal with... Uh, to deal with the nature of our resurrection as we get to verse 35 he says someone will ask how are the dead raised and with what kind of body do they come he says you foolish person what you sow does not come to life unless it dies and what you sow is not the body that is to be but a bare kernel perhaps of wheat or of some other grain but god gives it a body as he has chosen and to each kind of seed its own body for not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another kind for animals. So he starts giving examples out of creation. And he just says, look, uh, how, does this, how does this happen? How does it work? And basically how it works is that the perishable, he's going to say on a little bit later in the passage, the perishable is going to put on imperishable. Mortal is going to put on immortality. What's sown in weakness is going to become strength. And we'll see that in the triumph of the, of the resurrection in a few moments. But he says, what, what's going to happen? He says, you know what, look around you. A plant doesn't, when it gives off its seed, it doesn't unless it falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if those things fall into the earth and die, it becomes a whole crop of that same kind of plant. That's what produces life. He says, look, your body that you have 
is, is going to die and it's going to be planted. And it's going to be planted, but when Christ comes back, it's going to take on life. It's going to become alive again. And you know what? We don't have to worry about it. He recognizes, he says, it's perishable. You know, the fact that your body's perishable, that it's going to dust in the ground, decaying, turning into dust, that's what perishable means. That doesn't pose a challenge for God. Remember, he made us out of dust to begin with. He can scoop it together again. And no matter where it is, but we will all be resurrected. Now we find two things that stand out in this nature of the resurrection. Um, one is a continuity, that it is our bodies that will be resurrected. He emphasizes that, that we look forward to this resurrection. It's not just a new body that's created. There will be newness to it, but it, it will be a continuity. It will be us, our body that is resurrected again from the dead. But then not only is there continuity, but there's also change. Change, in fact, that's the way he described. He says the people that are still alive when Christ comes, the, the dead in Christ will be resurrected. He says those that are still alive won't be resurrected because we haven't died. He says they will be changed. Uh, the way the King James says that, it says they will not all sleep, but they will all be changed. I remember hearing somebody say that was their motto for their nursery at the church there. But, but uh, that's, the, that's the fact with Christianity is, is not all of us will die, but we... We will all be changed because when Christ comes, the dead will be resurrected and their bodies will be glorified. Their bodies will be triumphant. And we're going to need a change like that to take place even though we haven't died at that point. Well, then also we see the triumph of the resurrection in verses 54 through 57. And verses 54 through 57 it says, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of the sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, and we'll go on with that in a moment. Notice what he says. He says, there's coming a time when we're going to say, death, where's your victory? He's going to say to the grave, where's your sting? You know, every one of us that are here this morning that has had to say goodbye to a loved one knows the sting of the grave. You know that, that feel that feels like death has gotten a victory at that moment. And the, and the Word of God says that there's coming a day when, almost in mockery, we say, what do you got for us now, grave? Where's, where's your strength, death? Because it'll be done away with. It says the last enemy to be, be, defeat, be defeated is death. And that day's coming. And so when we look at the resurrection, what do we see about the resurrection? That it is triumphant, that it triumphs over the grave, it triumphs over death itself to give us life. And then lastly, we see the application of the resurrection in verse 58. He says, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. So I would say in this passage, it's telling us to do two things. It's telling us to stand. He says, look, be steadfast and immovable. In other words, stand strong. And what else does he tell us to do? Strive. Strive. And then he uses that word vain one more time. Why do we stand strong in the faith when even death itself is shaking our world? Why would we push forward and strive in our relationship with God and the ministry of Jesus Christ? Why would we strive and push forward in that when we're over encountering amazing obstacles? He says, because you know that your labor in vain or your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Why is our labor not in vain? Because of the resurrection of the dead. You see, because Jesus Christ and his resurrection is a historical reality. That means that our resurrection is a future reality. 
And so we can stand anything. And we can strive through any circumstances because of what we have in Christ. That is the resurrection. Our Father, we're thankful, so thankful for the hope that we have in the resurrection. And by hope, I don't mean a, a, I hope it'll happen. I mean a confident expectation. I am absolutely certain beyond a shadow of a doubt that, that Christ's resurrection was absolutely true. And that because of that, I am absolutely certain that our resurrection is also true. Father, thank you for giving us, because of this, a life that is not futile, a life that is not in vain. Help us to live that life. It's in Jesus' name we pray it. Amen.